Okay, so I'd like to welcome everybody to uh, this session uh, for GSE conference, uh, a virtual conference in the UK. Um, thanks for joining this session. So this session is, um, the session code is 5AO, and it will be on, is your IMS the best it can be? And it will be by uh, Dennis Eschenberger, who's from IBM. So um, without further ado, what I'll do is just go through a few admin items. So um, firstly, just to let everybody know that uh, this session is recorded um, and it will be available for video later on um, at the end of the conference and you'll be able to play that back probably um, uh, for um, at least two weeks after the conference. Um, hopefully the slides will be available as well um, to download at some point. So uh, Dennis will probably um, pass them to me and I can look up those, upload those in due course. Um, if we have feedback at the end of the session, then there's this QR code here. If you can see that on the slide in front of you, so you can take that um, as and do a feedback. We really love your feedback of every session that we have. So um, please do that. Alternatively, you can actually do it via, um, if you go onto the conference website, you can use, um, you can basically go onto the agenda. And then for this session, um, just find this session in the agenda. It's an avocado green color. Um, obviously the title, um, if you click on the title, is your IMS the best it can be, then that will, you'll be able to follow a link to do the feedback as well. In terms of questions, what I'd like is um, if people can feel questions on the chat to me. So if you can just, um, in the chat session, you just uh, post your questions during the presentation, and I will then feed those back to Dennis um, verbally. Okay, so if you could do that via the chat, and I will then speak verbally, and no doubt at the end we'll probably open up the um, open up the call so that we can open up the session so that we can have uh, people um, in a general discussion if they want to. Okay, so without further ado, I'll introduce you to Dennis. Now, Dennis has been part of um, of Mainframe for over forty five years experience um, in mainframe and I think he started off as a developer he's done various things including consultancy um, a business partner for IBM I think and business partners for others and also a vendor to IBM in the past and currently is with IBM and um, he's in the IMS support team so without further ado I'll um, hand you over to Dennis. Well, thank you, Dominic. That was great. Um, yes, this is Dennis, and uh, IBM. I am the I am one of the IMS support persons out of the Washington System Center in the U.S. And uh, yes, been doing it a little bit. So uh, today, I'm going to talk about is your IMS the best it can be? Um, and this, the, I just wanted to mention that this title actually came out of a line in the movie called Top Gun where the leader of the education guy says, you're the best of the best, we're gonna make you better. And that's my plan. I'm gonna make you understand IMS. Well, I'm gonna present it and you can decide. So first off, um, there's a charity raffle. Don't want you to forget that. Uh, there's the link there, follow the QR code and please help us out. So to start off, I'm hoping everyone has at least a basic familiarity with IMS. It's been around a long time, more than 50 years, uh, which makes it even older than I am in the IT world or data processing, if you were back then. It does what two other systems do together. And I guess you could probably figure out what they are, but we'll not go there. We're just talking about IMS at the moment. And it has been around a long time. So there are many major businesses that depend upon IMS. There's also many medium businesses and some small businesses, all depending upon IMS. It is a 
great system because it is reliable, stable, and scalable. And by re reliable, I mean, it's been around for a while. There's a lot of folks out there that are going to say, I am asked, what's that? Well, when I am asked by my wife's friends what I do for a living, I tell them I make sure that their credit cards work so that they can shop. And that is the primary thing that IMS does. Yes, it does a lot of other things. It does scheduling, it does parts, it does personnel. But the primary thing it does is process those credit cards. And without credit cards or ATM cards, a lot of people are not going to be able to shop. That's what they depend upon. And because it is versatile, reliable, stable, it's often taken for granted. And that's the serious problem. Everyone likes the new stuff. Pythons, the Javas, the newer languages, the ability to have a web-based system. In a lot of ways, that's not really paying attention to IMS. IMS is out there and it's a lot like changing the oil in your car. Well, you don't have to do it every six months or four months or whatever your schedule is with the dealer. You cannot do it. And then what happens after eventually? It stops running. So even if it, you can't take it for granted, sometimes it's even neglected. Well, it's working stably. It's working great. What do we need an IMS resource for? All right, this is not where we want to be. We have to be able to tune it, make it work, and explain that to management so that the users at the other end are still happy with the response time they're getting. So what is the response time you're getting? And this basically comes down to three basic questions. When was the last time you looked at your IMS? There's various tools and I'll talk about those. When was the last time you actually looked at IMS? Do you know what's happening? Do you know what the response times are? Do you know if there's any bottlenecks? Things of that nature. And when was the last time someone complained about IMS? Now, I've been in many, many installations, large transport companies, large banks. And one of the first things when there's a problem is it's IMS's fault. Why is it IMS's fault? It's IMS's fault because IMS has been around longest. I've got books on IMS about using DLI lookups into databases from 1962. That's a long time ago. It's even before IMS was made generally available to the public. So it's been around a long time and everyone thinks IMS is old. It's just not up to date, not very futuristic and it's not modern. Well, when people start complaining, you gotta stop and think, is that really an IMS problem? Or is it how, and do you want to deal with it as an IMS problem? Or do you want to go back and look at the problem? All right, that's a different presentation called the pathology of problem solving. But right now, when was the last time someone really complained about what was IMS? It was a legitimate problem. Let's, we're going to talk a little bit about that. Now, even though IMS has been around for a long time, and it was GA'd in the late 60s, we've added a lot of features. And I've run across, I'd say, more than average, more than 50% of the customers have not implemented features that are more than basic. It's been neglected and all of a sudden, hey, they want to modernize. And we run into some things like data gravity. It's easier to use the data where it is than move it around because that's expensive. I, I ran across one customer who was using 40%, 46% of their processing power to move data around when all they had to do was modernize IMS in a very insignificant way to keep the data where it was and save a lot of that processing power. So let's talk about what was in IMS that we haven't done yet. It's been around for years and often not used. Right, DBRC, implemented in the 1980s, early 1980s, it became general availability. Now, what is DBRC? DBRC is Database Recovery and Control. And there are three levels of that. One of those basic levels is being able to recover databases, recording the history and the ability to keep it current 
especially if something were to happen where it broke. Now, sometimes before 1980 or so, there would be a really smart programmer in there who would go through and create their own procedures. He'd make it programmatic and things would work fine. However, that was the 1980s and he's probably retired by now. And But because these procedures are around, no one's upgraded to DVRC, so it's not really being used. The other one is IMS Connect. Let's move, IMS Connect is the IMS TCP IP socket server. That allows web-based services to come into IMS and run the same transaction as if they were using a green screen. And there's a lot of recent growth there, but it's been kind of a, a fight because people are unsure how to use it. And one of my favorite, kind of a jaw-dropping moment is that we don't need IMS because we use iTalk. Well, iTalk is IMS Connect's predecessor. Some other things, HalDB. All right, look, data is growing. I've got estimates of data from five years ago that show that we should have half as much data as we do today. So essentially, data keeps growing faster than we can keep up with it. One of the things that help, helps us do that is HalDB, High Availability Large Database. That's a lot of data. We can have up to 80 terabytes of data in a hierarchically organized fashion. However, that sometimes runs into the same customers who had no databases registered to DBRC because this is a requirement. And suddenly they need DBRC to make this work. Type two commands. Type two commands are relatively new. They're a little bit more easy to understand and have a lot more ability to be used in IMS. They require some infrastructure, like an operations manager address space, a structure control interface, so we can pass those commands amongst IMS, and a single point of control, or SPOC, which allows you in ISPF to point commands at either all of the IMSs in a Plex, if you have a Plex, or a single one. These commands are actually much more important than you think. You might not think you need them, but type two commands out of the labs are the ones that are being enhanced and added to for IMS operations. Type one commands, the good old uh, command character slash DISA is all it's going to be. It will never be enhanced. Any new enhancements are going to go to the type two commands. Type two commands can also be run by batch. You can have a batch job that will do certain commands outside of ISPF and it can be time controlled. So you can change things based upon time of day. As we get into continuous and high availability, that means access to the data that the users want cannot stop. That access must be available 24 by seven. So we get into sharing data across two IMSs that can look at the same database. This gets into having pools. In IMS, we have buffer pools for databases. When we start sharing those, we have to make a buffer pool for both IMS. And we set that up in a public facility structure. So we're using XCF to keep track of that for both the shared pools for databases and the locking for the IRLM, the IMS region locking manager. Okay, that's the old thing, inter-region locking manager. Then there's shared queues. When we can have IMSs in a plexed environment that allow any available IMS to process the same transaction. And what that means is that those IMSs can go away for maintenance, come back up, and another IMS has taken up the load and continuing processing. I know as a user, I don't want to wait for my data. I have had experiences where I've had to wait for my data. I've been standing in line at an ATM when the IMS went down and my beeper went off. That's how old I am. So I had to go to work. Now, if we have a shared use environment, my beeper wouldn't have gone off and I would still be able to access my data. Dynamic resolution, resource definition. Right, if we're in a CA and HA environment, we may need to make changes. So we can add and modify resources without service interruptions to that IMS, all dynamically. All of this requires a little bit of infrastructure setup, 
and it's all documented. However, if you do need help, my email is on the first slide. Lastly, the IMS catalog. The IMS catalog's been around for quite a while. It's been about four releases now since it came out. Well, three and a half. And the IMS catalog is a direction. I mean, you can certainly use it today. It's simply another database. The statement of direction is that IMS will require a catalog in IMS managed ACBs. We've got no date, no version, no release level. However, it is the statement of direction. So what I always tell customers is that you might wanna take a look at using it now. IMS catalog itself is simply a database. And we can implement that database as a catalog without having managed ACBs. Then when we get used to it, we can use that information and that will create a directory. Sound familiar? One of the other guys uses a, a definition of a directory also. And yes, we're gonna use the same one. That are, the IMS directory uses resources that look a lot like an ACB resource. So it will work quite the same. The major advantage here is that we allow DDL, data definition language, to be used to create resources on the database side as we go along. So I can use some tooling and enter DDL to update a database. For instance, if I want to add fields to it, why would I want to add fields to an area that hasn't been defined with fields before? because Java likes using fields to find things. And there's a lot of Java programmers out there that we can use to modernize IMS with. They can get in and they're pretty quick about their programming. And Java's been around in IMS for a while and it performs quite well. So that's an option that helps with modernization. Everything now is up to what is available that many people haven't used yet. If you haven't used them, I urge you to take a look at them and get them implemented. There's a lot that can help you with the modernization of IMS and keep IMS at the same speed as running now available to your customers. So other than that, you have a current system. We're, I'm not going to make assumptions about your system. It could be have everything I just spoke about or it could have pieces of it. But let's work on what we have. We're gonna make IMS the best it can be, right? How do we do that? How would you make it the best? Well, we have to know what's there first. So we start with monitoring. And then we report a little bit on that to make, put pieces together because no one wants, wants to read a hex line of code. We're gonna report it so it comes out more clean, more cleanly. Then we're gonna take a look at those reports and analyze it. Analyzing what's going on is an understanding a lot of your business environment, and a lot of how IMS works. Then we're gonna make some changes. Now, what's the great thing we're gonna do once we make a change? We're gonna start over. We're gonna monitor again. We're gonna report again. So it becomes a cycle. So if you don't have an IMS resource, this is going to be a little bit time consuming to get people in there. If you do, this can be a regular process that can be automated. We're gonna show you some tools and how to do this. What are some of those tools? <laughs> well, out of IMS itself, <clears throat> the engine has several tools, DFS UTR0. That's a DT, DC monitor report. And while we say DC monitor, it does report databases out of a DB system also. ERA10, that just prints log records. However, there is a subroutine in there called DFS ERA20, and that gives you deadlock reports. That's one of the the worst things an application can run to is deadlocking on itself. There's ISTS0, the statistical analysis utility. There's the log transactional analysis utility. Now, one of the uh, add-ons, it is a PID, an additional PID to IMS. It's called the IMS Performance Analyzer. It is a reporting tool, which includes everything I just spoke about and some things that are not reported at all in any of the engines. So we're going to talk about those. I'm going to use several of these tools as demonstrations 
of what you can look for and some of the recommendations based upon the information I'm going to show. Now, what I'm going to show are actual customer reports. I blanked out the names and so forth, so we don't see the customer name. All we're going to see is the data that it reports and what the recommendations are based around that data. And I'll talk about some of the things. Now, with all of those, what do we want to monitor within IMS? IMS has a lot of things going on in it. As I said, it's a two-part system. It's a transaction monitor and a database manager. So we want to log, look at the logging. That's going to be always there regardless of what type of IMS you have. We'll have database buffers we want to look at. In a transaction monitor system, we're going to have message queues to look at. Regardless also, we're going to have system pools. If there's database lookups, we're going to have locking. IRLM is going to be involved to protect the integrity of those databases, which is one of IMS's big points. We do make sure that the data is integrated and reliable and current, and we have methods of rebuilding it should something happen. Then we get into IMS checkpointing. And that's part of how we do recoveries. We don't want to recover back to the first time you started IMS four years ago. That would be a long recovery. And you'd have to keep four years worth of data around. So we have checkpoints. Checkpoints move that recovery period forward each time a checkpoint is taken. Now, depending upon the activity of your system, that checkpoint could be very frequent, hourly or daily. However, we do keep track of that, and that's the information that we use to put into DBRC, our database recovery and control information, to keep that data current. Then there's application deadlocks. So this is a partial list, by the way. So what do we want to do? We want to monitor everything. Now, why do I say everything? Because I could be looking at logging. That's an example I use right here. Under logging, I could look at something like that and suddenly discover, oh, logging is being affected by database buffers, IRLM locking, or checkpointing. So I want to monitor everything. But when I'm looking at something, I may be focusing on a particular area. If I have a database response issue, I might want to look at just database buffers to start with. Are the buffers adequate? So there's a whole bunch of things. Yes, that's a real technical term, I know. But we want to look at everything. If we look at everything in the monitors, we can go back and we have that as a point in time. And if we do it again, we have a delta. We can see differences. Maybe I'm suddenly looking at database buffers and I discover, hey, my buffers are fine, but my message queues are overloaded because they're too small. See, we have somewhat of a cascade effect. If I don't have that available later, I have to go back and re-monitor to get it. So if I do everything at once, I've got it all together, and I can look at the pieces that are required for the particular instance I'm looking for. So that's why I say everything. Today, today's session is chapter one. I'm currently working on chapter four. I hope you'll behave and we'll see those later. Right now, chapter one, we're going to look at the low-hanging fruit. The first things that we go for, IMS logging. IMS logging is important. If IMS runs out of logs, it stops. It's designed to do that. It will just stop because it can't go forward and it will say, I need another log. So we're gonna look at logging, hopefully to avoid that situation completely. The IMS message queues. This is primarily a transaction monitor issue, but message queues are very important in making sure those transactions process at a regular rate and fast enough that the customers are not going to be calling in saying, where's my data? And then the third thing is database buffer. Those are just three. I'm gonna go through some samples, some examples and talk about what I was looking for and what I saw. I'm gonna use several tools to demonstrate what the reporting capabilities might be. So logging. Here is a print of the logging. 
Now it's got logical logger and physical logger. This is a report, it is a customer report. In this, there's no real data, just numbers of what was happening. So I'm gonna break this down for you a little bit and some of the things I'm going to look at. Now as a performance analyzer report, DC monitor does not present this information. It only presents um, information about buffers and message queues. It does not prevent, present the logger information. And this is kind of important. Logger is really important. As I said, if IMS runs out of logs, it stops. If it has interesting things going on, it halts for a minute and then restarts, which is not quite as bad, but it's still a tremendous impact to your operations. So the first thing I wanna look at, weights for rights. And there's several types. There's just general weights and rights in general, which means that the logical logger can't write to a log buffer because that log buffer is still in a state of being hardened, being written to the olds completely. If it doesn't get completed and there's weights coming, logical logger is going to wait. It's got a latch up that it says, I can't release that until I'm done writing. So we've got weights for writes in general, 666, yes, that could be a bad number. Buffer weights. Checkpoint invokers and non-checkpoint invokers also, also have buffer rates. So circle then red. We'll have some other circles in red here that we'll talk about. Check write requests. A check write is when I send out a request to DASD. I'm going to do the I.O., but I want you to tell me that I got that the I.O. got there. So we're going to wait for that. And that is an impact also. There's things we can do that will help avoid this. We'll talk about those in a couple of slides. Log buffers, 20 log buffers, okay? Old block size, 26,624. This is something that we're going to address also. And then buffers waiting that needed checkpointing, posting at checkpoint, 33,000. So there's a lot of those. And this is kind of interesting to me. I'm gonna get to that in a minute. Um, but the last thing we're going to look at, this is kind of yellow. Uh, the time of I.O., average time here. The watch time is in 424 uh, millionths of a second, where I would be looking at something closer to half of that is what I would expect from hardware response times. So these appear to be a little bit high. So let's go on. I've got my red circles and I've got my yellow circle. So let's talk about the reds to start with. 20 log buffers, 20 bu log buffers. Let's bring that up here. So I've got a cumulative wait time of 3.183 seconds, which is okay, because this is an hour and a half period. I've got an old block size of 26K and log buffers of 20. Um, Trick question, does anyone know the default log buffers out of the IMS if you never code a buffer count? It's five. Five is really low, it's a default. And over the past year, I found nine, so far nine customers using the old buffer default. Five buffers, I don't even make it that small in my demonstration system where there's one person using one transaction every minute. That's a really slow IMS, but I don't even use five buffers there. So what the combination of the weights for rights and the weights for checkpoints indicate is that there is not enough buffers for the logical logger to continue processing until the physical logger gets done with its IO. So we want to indicate that. So Increase the buffers. How high can we go with buffers? So several thousand right now if you want to go to 64-bit buffer. But my recommendation here is 200. And how did I come up with that? It's kind of an estimate, but it's also kind of based upon the weights for rights and the waiters that need to be posting at checkpoint. Because I alluded to the fact that I had a problem previously, and I have just found the answer to it. The scary problem thing about that is that it's taken me 20 years to find that answer. 
So maybe the good news is that I continue learning and never stop. I finally got to the point where I understand what was going on. The customer had a spike exactly the same time every day. And we could see it was a spike. It was basically a logging spike. And what was happening was that there was a long running BMP that did not take many checkpoints. And when it did end, there was a tremendous amount of data that needed to be written as a log because we've ended the BMP, that's a, a checkpoint for the BMP. So it has to be hardened. There was so much data that it overran the amount of buffers several times. And that was the wait. We're writing, writing those faster as fast as we can, but there's still more data filling it almost immediately. And it's kind of, a, until we get to the end of it, it's kind of this little cycle of waiting. So it's not quite the attitude of bigger buffer, more buffers. We do have to do that because there's storage constraints. But here I've got 200 and I should be able to reduce the weights for writes and the weights for checkpoint invokers. So that's how I came up with that number. Yes, it's an estimate. It's an educated estimate. And when I put it in, I'm going to go back and monitor it again to make sure it did what I thought it should. <laughs> and that's the one of the greatest things about any performance thing, you get to do it over and over again. Okay, that's recommendation number one under OLS. Let's look at number two. The old block size. The old block size is at 26,624. Now that's really, really good for track sizes because the track size is a little bit over that for two buffers to fit onto a track. We use that track efficient. That's okay, that's fine. That's actually still in the menu. However, one of the things I wanna point out as if we start using Media Manager and allocate the olds as an extended format data set, we must use a multiple of 4096, 4K. And this means we can make some significant improvements in performance beyond what we've done with buffering. It allows us to use hyperwrite, especially if you're mirroring, this is very important. The latency is reduced by almost 17% if you're using hyperwrite when you go to an EVA extended format data set for the olds. On the same system, we could use high performance FICON. That's installable and we don't have to turn that on and off. If it's there, it's used. It also allows olds to be moved above the bar where we get a lot of buffers. I saw some the other day with something like 6,000 buffers above the bar. They're very happy, they get great performance. But it does allow two things to happen there is that if it's a moved above the bar, the storage that is below the bar, 31 bit stuff, can be released for other uses such as database. So there's gains all around. So to implement that, we have to lower the buffer size to 24, which is a multiple of 4K and allocate it on an extended format volume as an extended format data set. Now, in order to use this also, we have to add or make sure that in the IA sys member of sys1 parm live, we have an LF area defined that will include the amount of space we need for the buffers that we're adding in. Now, this one's tricky. The LF area is used by everyone on your ZOS. So if DB2 uses it and IMS uses it, we have to have enough space for both because if there's space for one or just one and a half of what we want to use, whoever is first gets it all. Whoever is second doesn't get any and we default to the old style buffer. So be very careful with that one. Talk to your ZOS programmer about the LF area and it, if it is large enough to handle everyone that wants to use it. And then if you're using mirroring hyperwrite, that's actually a command. And we have to turn that on in two places. There's a, a ZOS command, and we have to turn it on in our DFS DF member saying we are going to use hyperwrite, yes or no. And that can be done for both wads and olds. 
Okay, so that's that's pretty straightforward. Now, to implement this, there's a couple of steps, and I want to point out um, it does require an IMS outage to bring down the IMS because you cannot roll through folds and change the block size. Why is that? That's way back when, when we created DCBs and DSCBs. IMS uses a single DSCB, which decide, uh, describes the data set for the olds. So there's only one DSCB that's kind of rolled through the olds also. So if I change that DSCB in the middle of a run, there's actually an error and IMS says, I can't use that old, that throws it away. It basically says it's unusable. If you go to the next one and it has the same, then you could get into that potential position of not having an old to run your system and IMS will stop. So IMS needs to come down for that. With that though, in the DFSDM member, you can change your buffers, buffer store, the buffer count to increase the sizes. One of the things that you need to be aware of though, is that during recovery processes, if the old old information is still available in the recon, it will try to use the old olds with the old DSCB instead of the new one, and the recovery JCL will fail. Now you can override this by using an SLDS, or you can delete the logs from the recon completely and just let them allocate, which means that when you do a gen JCL out of DBRC, that will automatically go to olds because it can't find an olds. I'll go to the SLDSs because it can't find the olds. Okay, so there's little steps along the way. Um, checklist is available. Okay, so let's look at now the average response time. Average per write, pretty high. Um, I would expect to see these numbers at approximately half of what they are to a well-tuned DASD environment. Now, this may not be an IMS direct issue. It could be a problem with the DASD array. And this is what we've discovered on another system. This is another customer. And this time he's circled in red because we've got uh, average wait times that are very high. They're in thousands of a second, two thousandths of a second. And this is this is not good for a well two DASD system. And I also want to note another thing. Note that the primary old's maximum time actually is in three tenths of a second. There was a point when writing to that particular data set was three tenths of a second. In the ZOS world, that's really high. So what actually happened? We've got high averages. We've got high maximums. What was going on? Well, what we found was while the hot IO times were very high, reported in milliseconds, averages tenths of a second, so forth. And we went to the DASD hardware folks and said, what's going on? We've got these numbers showing. And they ran their EREPs, they ran their RMF data and said, no, we don't see it. You're and not writing. Well, we, these maximum times are the actual maximum times of a, a specific IO. And we record the time it happened, which is kind of hidden by the right side of the screen, but it is in the PDF that I uploaded. So you be able to see the actual time of day. So what we went back and we said, well, what's your interval? Then we're reporting 30 minute intervals. So we said, well, bring it down, make your interval smaller. By the time they got it down to five minutes, they could see the spike that we were seeing in IMS. So what you have now, I thought this was kind of entertaining. What we have now is IMS diagnosing hardware problems. <laughs> kind of exciting when you look at it. But what we found out was that they were all, everything was allocated to the same frame of DASD and it was all being mirrored. So there was a period when that mirroring hit every piece of DASD on that frame at the same time, and we got the spike. So the solution was not an IMS one. It was actually a hardware one where they redistributed what was being mirrored and got the times into the category that we were looking for. And I just think it was really kind of fun. We were able to tell hardware how to do their job. 
Okay, to summarize logging, we went through some stuff, what to look at. This is a PA report. You can get a lot of this other information from um, SNF, IO reports, and so forth, but the PA report presents it very easily and quite readably. But other things I want to mention in logging, and these are things that have come up with other customers also. Are the old data sets large enough to keep up with the volume? Uh, or to say it another way, do the old archives run faster than an old online data set fills? If you have an old that fills up every four minutes, and for some reason it takes you five minutes to archive it, eventually you're going to run out of those. So olds can be allocated very large. You can use a mod 56 on it to get it really big. Um, but the point is that if you have a period of time, a very high activity time that IMS can log faster than the olds can be archived, this is a wariness that you need to be keeping track of so that you don't run a volt and your IMS doesn't stop because it will stop until an old finishes and releases that, uh, till the archive finishes and releases the old. So it could be one of these things where it's periodic or it could be one of those where you really need to allocate more olds and recommend having them available in an MDA where you can bring them online if needed. Um, so that's something to be aware of. And lastly, check rights. Um, we talked about check rights back on the first slide of the report. Um, extended format data sets are reputed to ignore check right. I do see some reports that include them, but they're very much at a lower level than what was before. So another reason for moving to extended format data sets at a 4K multiple. <coughs> Okay, excuse me a second. All right. Message queues. Message queues data sets. This is where someone sends in a transaction, green screen or uh, OTMA, and it gets put onto a message queue. It gets sent out there waiting for IMS to respond to it and process it. So message queues we've had a long time. If you look in the manual, there's some very interesting stuff that appears to be very uh, old on how to make them allocated appropriately. So let's talk about that. Um, what size are they now? Are they the appropriate size? And how do you know? Well, how do you know? You could ask. A display pool, a command will show them what the sizes are. Just look for the message queue, and it will show you short message, long message, and queue buffers. We can also go look at the database data set defi definition there, and we can do reporting. So what I've got here is a report, the ISDS report transaction. And we're going to look at some sizes of messages coming in. This is an average size. So I've got a size of a short record off to the right. Um, that's going to be a little bit hard to see, but I, I think when we get down to it, uh, we'll be able to see. So my short message queue is, I believe it's around 600 bytes. And that shows to be pretty good for my short message queue. I've got messages that are averaging 53 bytes, 154, 114, and they're going to fit into a short message buffer. Now remember, this is without OTMA or IMS Connect using OTMA. This is just off of a green screen. Now I've got a log message queue that shows me 3K. And guess what? That's 3296 is just over 3K. So we end up using an extra buffer. And this is sized not so good. So let's look at what we can do when we add OTMA. All right, OTMA adds a prefix of 504. So if I add that to 114, I'm oversized for the short message buffer. It means I'm gonna fall into a long message buffer. So it's not so good in this case if I start using OTMA. And more and more people are using IMS Connect, which is OTMA. So we're gonna get this header added on. 
And I think that's actually going to grow a little bit based upon what I know. So uh, we're still going to try to increase that. My 53 bytes, that's still good. That'll fit. But the other ones don't. What we had before now falls into the upper queues, upper sized queues. All right, so if I add 504 to 3296, I'm still not so good because I'm still over the 3K that was allocated originally. So we need to take a look here and see what we can do to change that. Now, I'm putting this one up because I actually ran into this. Every, this one company decided that um, IMS Connect was the way to go, which you know, I can't fault. I think that is a good idea. It allows more GUI use at the user side and the transaction doesn't have to change on the IMS side. However, their short message queue was so small that by the time they added it, the queue was not being used at all. So it was a waste of an allocation. So that was one of the big tuning things that we get, did do. We improved that just by adding to it. So here's what we see. Retro length was 392 for my sh uh, short message, block size and so forth. So here's the recommendation that was given to them just to start off. Rebalance the message queue usage. Increase source short message to 1024. Increase the long message to 4096. And yes, IMS needs to be restarted, although it can be restarted warm with a format long message and short message or a format all. So we don't need to do a cold start here, a warm start would work, but we do need to restart IMS with the message queues being reallocated in between. One more thing on that. Even though I've been doing this a while, I still make mistakes. I used to say I made fewer and fewer mistakes that just got bigger and bigger. However, this one wasn't quite so big, but it was kind of, you had to stop and think about it. When we adjust short message and long message queues, they must be multiple values of 56 because that's what the queue buffer value is. That's still the queuing pointers that we use to get to the DRRNs that record that information on the DASD. So if the short message and long message are not a multiple of four, IMS is gonna bump it to the next multiple of four. And if you're not careful, this is gonna affect your queue buffs. So calculate this out, put it, write it down, use a calculator, however you wanna do it, but make sure that you do have the short message and long message as multiples of 54 in order to make this work the first time. Okay, message queues. Let's go on to database buffers. That's the third thing we're going to look at. This is more application dependent or multiple application dependent because we have multiple applications perhaps looking at the same databases. They might contend and that's where buffering comes in. So what size are your buffers? This is a report, a DC monitor report of a buffer pool. It's got a, a request to lo locate buffers, buffer pool size, um, it's being blocked. Can I move this? I can move that just enough to see it. 4096, and I got total buffers of 7,000. Okay, so that's okay. Uh, my hit ratio, moving it off to the side there, the other side. Um, I've got, this is a DC monitor, so it's only gonna show me a difference, what went on. Um, and I'm seeing things, all, data already in the OSAM pool at 34,000, and searched out of total calls of 38. This is pretty reasonable. It shows me OSAM reads and writes, and this is actually what we refer to as a uh, life of a buffer. What we keep it in the, how long is it in the buffer? The longer that buffer remains, the faster it's going to be found by the application, which is good because we can add things like sequential buffering for OSAM, which would increase response time because in, improve the response time because we have uh, a set of buffers that we primed into the system. 0.23 is good. Anything under one we consider to be good in this particular case. So green is good, 0.23. Okay, so let's look at a VSAM buffer 
um, 81, 92, 8K. There's only 60 buffers in this. It has um, its buffer life number is indicated at 1.66. Some other things in there, it's only 60 buffers. And that's really kind of low for any database these days. Uh, perhaps an index might be okay. But here we've got uh, things that are, our numbers are showing that intervals were read from external storage pretty highly, low buffers. So I've got a recommendation there. I'm going to move buffers up. I didn't have to recommend anything on the other one because it was a really good uh, number showing that the hits were being very close to what the total IOs were. But here, I'm going to increase from 60 to 100 and then go back and monitor it again. So here, this report, I want to look at. This is a performance analyzer report. It's a little bit different. It shows some in differently numbers. And this, this report can be used both as a standalone and as a delta. Now this report shows me, this is the same report based upon a 4K buffer OSAM that I have previously two slides back at 7,000 buffers. And it shows data already in the pool, 96%. Um, I always look at anything over 85 to 90 as good. This is really good. It's showing 93% of the IO operations did not have to go to there. I have no buffer steals, which is not shown in the DC report. Um, and I only have a 6% uh, 6, six plus percent being written during purge, which is when I'm forcing it out because the buffers are needed for another call. So the PA report gives us a method of looking at deltas. If I run this PA report the next day for the same time period, I will now have a delta of the hit ratio. Hit ratio is an indicator of how long that buffer life actually existed. And it's a lot easier for some people to read. As we say, this is an enhanced uh, buffer report. It gives you a little more information. Again, it's out of a performance analyzer, which does not come with the IMS engine. It's a separately um, offered PID. Some other buffering considerations. If you've got a highly used databases or a set of databases that are impacted by insufficient buffers, you might want to consider making it a dedicated buffer. Yes, we can assign them to a specific buffer pool for that database. The other thing that might be interesting is that if you have an index which isn't super large, it might be allocated such that there's enough buffers that it can remain in storage. That way there's no IO, it's always going to be there. Any IO that it needs to harden would be done asynchronously and everything stays there for actual processing. One of the other things I found is that as databases grow, sometimes they're going to increase the CI size or the block size, which means that the number that it was using, for instance, if I doubled, if I went from 4K to an 8K block size, the use of that 4K might have dropped. And if it's not being used significantly, there's no real reason not to fold those buffers upwards. Um, 6K, 2K, those kind of things are more obvious than 4 to 8, but they still can be folded up. And that's just analysis. If I've got something out there that isn't used for a significant period of time, or if it's only used for one period of time during a, a batch processing window, it's a consideration to fold it up and allow that space to be used for the bigger buffers and improve general performance across your IMS. The other thing, always make sure that in both vSAM and OSAM, you have some buffers available at the largest possible size. That's the fail safe in case somebody slips something in you're unaware of. It won't stop processing. Otherwise, you could get a buffer failure for that application and they'll say, IMS did it to me again. And it was just a misdefinition. Okay, cover the three things, logging, message queues, and database buffer. Those are general things to look at. Be glad to help out if you need someone to look at it over your shoulder, or if you have questions about what you're seeing, if it makes sense or not. 
But the next thing to do is once you make those changes, do the reporting again. And that's for two reasons. Did the changes really go into effect? It's happened sometimes because uh, the database buffer pools provide, reside in DFS VSM member. Perhaps you used the wrong one. There could be multiples. Want to make sure that those changes really hit the system you were trying for. Shoot at the target, make sure the target's the one you want to hit. And then the second thing is evaluate those effectiveness of what you did. Did it do what you expected it to? Is it as much as you needed it to, or could you increase it a little more or reduce it a little more? Adjustments. So it's a repeat. Look at the data, report again, verify, evaluate, and repeat. And to repeat myself, repeat again. I want to thank you for attending. It was great having you here. If anyone has questions, please jump in at this point. I got about Okay, I want to thank everyone for attending. Uh, don't forget the evaluation that helps us all. Yeah, thank you very much, um, Dennis, for that. Um, so if you've got any questions, anybody, um, then please unmute yourselves. Um, I'm just asking you to unmute now and you can ask your question verbally. I mean, I've got a quick one. Um, when you were talking about the buffer pools just before, um, on a couple of slides before, um, you were saying about um, there was, if you've got the buffer pool for the maximum one, you should always have something for the, did you say allocated for the maximum size of three to, was it 32K or something like that? Yes. Yeah, so so why is that? So is that if, if even, if, even if you don't have any in that yes. range even that uses it? Yeah, even if you're unaware of anyone using it, there's always the chance that someone will come in and make a change to like a 24K buffer. And if that's the maximum you have and suddenly they're running 26, they will get a buffer allocation failure. So making yeah. the maximum that IMS will allow allows that job to run. And maybe you only have five or 10 buffers there, but it's enough for that particular job to run. And if you start seeing being, it being used, there's ways of going back and tracking who's doing it and saying, why are you doing this? You don't want to be surprised by someone doing that, in other words. Okay, yeah, I get that. Thanks for that. Um, another, uh, probably a, an observation on um, when you're saying about um, OSAM. Um, so um, for some databases, it's also good to consider, some people have already got VSAM databases that, um, Sometimes it's good to consider converting them to OSAM, not just because of the performance, because um, with OSAM, perhaps making the most on data caching, but also um, occasionally, you know, the volume of four, four gigabytes from VSAM, you might want to convert, say, a, a full function one to, um, to eight gigabytes. And, and, and you can obviously do that with OSAM as well. So there, yeah. there are other benefits yeah. as well, but certainly the performance side from VSAM to OSAM, OSAM is actually, you know, better performance because there's less going on for the VSAM part. Yes, and I, I actually have, I just got a new chart on how much better. And you're, you're absolutely correct. It is significantly better especially if you start adding sequential buffering for long running BMP jobs. And we can do that conditionally as it goes also now. Excellent. So have you got any more questions for Dennis? We've got about a minute left. Okay, so I'll just emphasize again that um, Dennis is, um, we'll have the slides available and they'll be available on the website um, in due course. Um, the video playback will be available um, probably um, at the week after the conference and it'll be available for at least two weeks. Um, please use the feedback form with the, if you just do the QR code there, which is on the screen, 
um, and um, if not, then just go to the, you can go to the website at the agenda and then you can then click on the title of this session um, and then you'll be follow through the link to the um, feedback. So if I've got any more questions, we'd like to thank you all for attending. Thank Dennis in particular for a, a really comprehensive um, look at those first three um, performance things for IMS and uh, we welcome we look forward to everybody um, joining the next uh, IMS session which will be as one this afternoon at two o'clock um, but if you look on the agenda site you get the avocado green ones to look at which are all the IMS sessions available um, for this conference so uh, we'd like to see you again sometime so we'll wrap up and thanks very much everybody for attending thank you and have a good rest of your day and thanks dennis in particular for getting up so early this morning thank you <laughs> no problem yeah so we've had about 13 14 people so thanks very much bye <laughs>